The story is told of Uncle Zeke from Muleshoe, Texas. The thing about Uncle Zeke is that he would never admit that he was wrong. Never, no matter what the situation, no matter what happened, no matter what the story, he could never admit that he was wrong. Well, one day Uncle Zeke was walking through town, through Muleshoe, Texas. He was walking through town and he came upon the blacksmith shop. And he went to the blacksmith shop and he stepped in and, you know, the floor of the blacksmith shop is covered in sawdust. But just before he got to the door, what he didn't know is that the blacksmith had been beating on this horseshoe. And this horseshoe was not cooperating. And he was not being able to get the right shape from it. And so after beating it and beating it and beating it till it turned black and looked cool, he got frustrated and just threw it on the ground in the sawdust. Well, Zeke walks in and he sees the horseshoe on the ground, bends over, picks it up, and immediately drops it. And the blacksmith looks over with a smirk on his face and he says, kind of hot, ain't it, Zeke? Zeke's response, he looks straight at, straight at him in the face and says, nope, just doesn't take me long to look at a horseshoe. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am sure when Zeke picked up that horseshoe, that blacksmith was kind of laughing inside, saying, ah, there goes old Zeke again, until he heard the response. And then he was probably a little put off and said, well, Yep, there goes old Zeke again, and never admit that he is wrong. The thing is, it's a little hard sometimes to be around people like that, who can never be wrong. And, you know, it's kind of, well, it's a little obnoxious. And, uh, you know, the thing is, I'm sure we have all known people like that. We might say we've all known arrogant people like that. People who are never wrong, people who know everything, people who tell you how good they are. People who always want to be the center of attention, always want to be noticed, because when they walk in the room, it's like, hey, I'm here. And always, it's always about them. But what about the quieter ways that pride shows up? Like selfishness. You know, that's the root of selfishness is pride. You know, that that attitude of, well, it's either my way or I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to go this and I'm going to do this unless they're doing what I don't want to do and then I'm going to have no part in it. You know what that is? That's pride. That's saying I'm more important and I, my way is more important than anyone else. Or what about the attitude where things are beneath you? Is there anything that's beneath you? You know, the person says, well, some, you see something that needs to be done? He said, nah, somebody else will take care of that. That's not my job. Or when you ask, what's in it for me? As if that's the only reason we would do something is for what we get out of it. Or how about this one, when there's a difference of opinion? Now the thing is, if people are humble, you know what happens when you have a difference of opinion? You just have a difference of opinion. You're like, okay, well this is my opinion, that's your opinion, and okay, we, we see things differently. But when people are arrogant, prideful, not humble, differences of opinions become a disagreement. And those disagreements become resentment. And that, dis that resentment can become division. We see in the church, we are called to unity. But pride destroys it. Pride destroys unity, but humility builds unity. And humility is essential to unity and to the Christian life. And so Paul writes here in the ch second chapter of Philippians to encourage believers to be humble like Christ and to live together in harmony. So we begin in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, So... If there is any encouragement in Christ, 
any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. He begins his verse with the word so or therefore, which means that it's tied back to the previous verses that we were looking at. And the verses where we saw that we were told to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And we were told to stand firm together for Christ. And now he's going to go on and he's going to explain part of what that means. In other words, one way or part of how we do that, how we live in a manner worthy of gospel and stand firm for together for Christ. But the very first thing he does is he gives us our motivation. He tells us why we would do this. Um, and he says, because you have experienced the benefits of knowing Christ. He, he starts off as if you have and he names off these things. But that's what he's getting at. You have experienced these benefits of knowing Christ. And you know that we have, as Christians, we have experienced benefits of knowing Christ. To start with, I was a sinner, separated from God, cut off from God on my way to hell. And God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross in my place. And when I believed in him, I was forgiven. And I was given uh, life, eternal life. And that's true of everyone who has believed in Jesus. Every one of us cut off from God, separated from Him because of our sin, on our way to hell because of our sin. And when we believed in Jesus, we were forgiven and given eternal life and made a child of God. That's the good news that we've all believed and we all have experienced. Everyone who has believed in Jesus has experienced that benefit of being saved from our sins and becoming a child of God. And then on top of that, there are other benefits of knowing Christ that he gives us in our daily life. And we have the, the uh, privilege of having abundant life through Christ. And he has given us these things. There's so much more that he has given to us. But Paul lists off these four things or five things. And he says he begins with if there is any encouragement in Christ. He starts with this encouragement. Now, in English, we know that there are some different words that are kind of related to each other, like the word encourage, encourager, and encouragement. In Greek, the same thing is true. They have words that are related to each other, like that have the same root word. And here, we have this word encouragement. This is the same root word that is used of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus. So when, the, when Jesus says, I am going to send you another helper, encourager, this is the word that's used. In Jesus, is, in John 1, or 1 John, he says that, that if any of us sin, we have an advocate with the Father, an encourager, a helper with the Father. This is that same root word. So it can have that idea of help. So if there is any help in Christ, but the most basic meaning of this word, the root word here of encourage, is to call someone alongside to yourself. And so we, we use words like comfort, console or consolation, encourage, encouragement. But the picture here that I see in my mind is this. If there's any calling alongside, if there's any, like, it's the picture of someone taking and putting their arm around you and saying, here, let me help you. Let me encourage you. So if there is any encouragement or help in Christ, Paul uses it here in that general sense of any encouragement. And so we know that we have been helped. We know that we have been encouraged because first of all, we have been saved through Jesus Christ. That is a big help. In fact, it's something we could not do on our own, but Jesus did it for us. But we have also been given comfort. We have also been given assurance that he is with us and will always be with us. And we will have eternal life and be with him forever. Well, he moves on. He says, if there is any comfort from love. Now, this word comfort here refers to our basis of hope. In other words, we have hope because we know that Jesus Christ is with us. And we know that we have eternal life because he loved us and died for us. And so that's, this is the comfort we have. We have comfort from Christ. We have hope in Christ because we know that he has died for us, that he is with us, and that he loves us. And we will have eternity with him. Now these two words, encouragement and comfort, 
really can be used interchangeably. And if actually, if you look at the different translations, oftentimes they'll use the opposite words in those two different places. They may say comfort and then encouragement or consolation, that kind of thing. But these two words really could use, be used interchangeably. They have basically the same idea, but he's using different words to express the same thing twice. You see, I think Paul's making an emotional plea here. You know, like when you really want to get your point across, what do you, st- what do, you do? You start repeating yourself or restating yourself, your point. And, and sometimes it, it doesn't do any good because if the person doesn't agree, they don't agree. But you just say, but listen, and you say it another way. I think that's what Paul's doing here. He's making an emotional plea to the believers in Philippi. And he's saying, if there's any of this, then you need to do this. He's making this emotionally. He's really trying to get their attention. He's saying, Jesus died for you. He died to save you. He loves you. He's always with you. He helps you. Look at the benefits that you have in Christ Jesus. And so he's really trying to get their attention, making that emotional plea. And he continues on. He says, if there's any participation in the Spirit. This word participation is that same word we've, we've seen before. That, you, that means fellowship. So any fellowship or participation in the Spirit. It has the idea of having a close mutual relationship. If you have a close mutual relationship with the Spirit, if you interact with the Spirit, if the Spirit indwells you and helps you and leads you and guides you. And for Christians, that is true. And he helps us to live for Christ. And he says, if there's any affection and sympathy. This word affection literally means bowels or intestines. In fact, if you read in the King James, it will translate their bowels. And you might read across that and say, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. What it's doing is it's talking about our innermost person. In English or in American culture, we talk about our heart. I love you from the bottom of my heart. In other cultures, they say, I love you from my intestines or my kidneys or my uh, liver or my stomach. There's different ways that we express that. Here, we express it as heart. And this is what's going on here. He's talking about affection that comes from your innermost being, that kind of affection or love. We today would say something like, have a heart. We don't mean literally have a physical beating heart, but it means to be kind, be affectionate, be nice, be compassionate. And so this is the idea that's being expressed here. If there is any affection, love, compassion. And then the next word he says, and sympathy. And sympathy has that idea of pity or mercy, compassion. And, and, and so he says this affection and sympathy. The thing is that these two words, affection and sympathy, the, in, in Greek grammar could possibly be combined together to, to make one point of affectionate, um, uh, uh, affectionate ca- compassion or loving compassion or heartfelt sympathy. So if there is any loving compassion in Christ that you have. So you have this loving compassion, this this affection and sympathy that you've gotten from Jesus and because of Jesus. You've been given mercy. You've been shown love. You've been forgiven of your sins. You've been set free. So he says, you have experienced loving compassion. You have experienced uh, affection and sympathy. But in all of these things that Paul is talking about, he says, you have been helped and encouraged by Christ. You have experienced his love. You have been led by the Holy Spirit. You have received mercy from God. And there are many benefits of knowing Jesus Christ, and you have experienced them. So if that's true, What does it cause you to do? And that's why he starts with the word if. If that's true, then what response will you have? If that's true, then you ought to live like it. You see, this is our motivation, that we have experienced these benefits from Christ. And if we have experienced these benefits from Christ, then we ought to live out our lives for him. And the first point that Paul makes here about living as followers of Jesus is that we live in unity. 
Look at verse 2. He says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He starts by saying, complete my joy. This is another motivation for, for them to live uh, right, for them to live in uni unity and do what is right in following Christ, is that it will bring him joy. You see, Paul, the one who taught them about Jesus, who gave them the gospel and when they believed, the one who has helped them and taught them about Jesus, who they were very concerned for, he says, you can bring me joy if you do these things. And so he gives them another motivation. And he says, complete my joy or make my joy totally full. But you might ask, why isn't it already? We just heard Paul say, in that I rejoice. And yes, I rejoice. We've heard him say these things. Like, so why is his joy not full? Because that's, that's what he's in, in, in insinuating here when he says, make it, make it full. Why isn't it already? You see, it appears that in the experience that, that, that the, the Philippians, believers here, are experiencing some kind of struggle. That there are some within the church who are not getting along. In fact, we'll find some, hear some statements later on that says, tell so-and-so to get along. So it appears there's some who are not getting along. And maybe the early stages of division are starting to show. And Paul is wanting to stop it before it takes root. And so he's telling them, make my joy complete by doing these things. It's kind of like a father or a parent who sees his kids making choices that aren't good. They're making bad choices and the parent wants, his heart is breaking or her heart is breaking and wants the, to help them stop and make good choices for their own good. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's making this emotional plea from his heart. He's saying, make my joy complete. But it's for your own good. It's for the good of the believers that they would do this, that they would live in unity. And he names off four things that he wants them to do. And you can see these strong feelings that he has for these believers because he's, again, kind of repeating himself. In fact, the first and the fourth things he says here are basically the exact same thing. But all four of these words, or all four of these phrases restate are restating each other to make one single point. So he begins by saying, have the same mind. And the fourth thing he says, he says, have one mind. In other words, what he's telling them is you guys need to think the same way. You need to have the same purpose in life. And what he's talking about here is what we would call today your worldview. The way you view the world, the way you look at things, the way you think about things. He says, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, you need to have that same mind, that same way of thinking. The thing is, is if you think about the way we as Christians think about life and about the world, it's very different than the way a non-Christian thinks about life and thinks about the world. You talk about our moral differences, well, it's because of our basic beliefs and the way we look at life and look at the world. And we talked about this last week. For a Christian, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So my life is all about Christ. And so everything I do revolves around Christ. Every decision I make, I run through the grid of Christ. What would Jesus do is a good question to ask. He says, how does Jesus think about these things? What does God think about things? How does my relationship with Christ affect this thing or this decision I make? And so this is what he's saying. You think alike. If life is all about Christ, it is because we know him, we love him, we follow him, and we obey him. If life is all about Christ, then the gospel is a top priority in our life. If life is about Christ, we will run every decision we make through that grid. And as Christians, we all share the most important things in life in common. Because the most important thing in life is Christ. is our relationship with God. And so he says, so you should think the same. You should have the same purpose in life. You need to have the same mind. 
he continues on, he says, you also need to have the same love. And the thing is, is we have all experienced, as Christians, we have all experienced the love of Christ, which means that we understand what love really is. But being Christians and having experienced the love of Christ and understanding what love is, we are able to then express Christ-like love toward others and towards each other. So he says, you have the same love as well. But think about that for a minute. How would we act differently towards each other? If we express a kind of love or the thing that what comes naturally to us as humans, sinful humans, versus if we express Christ-like love towards each other. How different does that look? Just think about that. Paul continues on, and I want you to be in full accord. In other words, I want you to, to be in agreement with each other. This word full accord literally is to be one soul or same, have the same soul. The idea is that we live and work together like we're connected, like we belong to each other, like we, uh, that we are to live and work together in harmony. Which means that we are many individuals, but we are living in unity. And when I say that, I say that we are many different people. We're all different. We have different backgrounds. We have different, come from different cultures. We have, we, we're different. We have different likes and dislikes. But we live as one. And we stand together for Christ. One person said it this way. He says, or said this. He says, the true obstacle to unity is not the presence of legitimate differences of opinion, but self-centeredness. So the, the, the obstacle to unity isn't that we are different, but that we're selfish, that we are self-centered, that we're prideful. And this is where Paul goes to next. The things that destroy unity and how to counter counteract that. Look at verse 3 and 4. He says, do nothing from selfish, selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So he says, do nothing from rivalry or selfish ambition and conceit. Basically what he's talking about there, selfishness. Being self-seeking. Gaining for yourself at the expense of others. Rather than building others up, we're building up our own ego. Building up myself. It's that, it's all about me type attitude. It's that looking out for number one attitude. But do you catch what Paul said about that? He said, do how much? Out of selfishness. Out of self-centeredness. Out of rivalry or conceit. He said, do nothing. And I think if we're honest, that's hard to do. You know, we look out for ourselves all the time. It comes very natural to us to take care of ourselves. In fact, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, there's a good reason for that because we are really good at loving ourselves. We know how to love ourselves. And he's saying, love other people like that. So being selfish or being self-centered is actually very easy for us to do. To do nothing from selfish ambition or self-seeking or selfishness is very difficult. But 
But Paul, that's what Paul says to do. Do nothing from self-seeking, for self-seeking reasons. Rather, he tells us, you need to do the opposite. Rather than seeking things for yourself, he says, you need in humility to count others as more significant than yourself. When he says count others as more significant, that's what he means. You need to consider other people to be more important than you. Again, that is totally counter to what comes natural to us. That's counter to what our culture tells us. But Paul says you consider other people to be more important, more significant than yourself. And to do this, it requires humility. It requires that you are not all about me, that you recognize I am not most important. It is not all about me. And Paul's here saying, basically what he's saying is this, don't be motivated in the things that you do. Don't be motivated by selfishness. Don't be motivated by promoting yourself. Don't be motivated by what you get out of it, but rather put others first. And then he adds on this. Don't only think about your own interests, but think about the interests of others as well. And like I said, it's so easy to think about our own interests, the things that we like and dislike, the things that we want, the things that we are comfortable with. And Paul doesn't say ignore all that, but he says, don't stop there. Don't only think about yourself. But he says, think about others as well. In other words, make an effort to truly consider what other people like and dislike, what other people uh, want, what other people desire, what other people uh, are comfortable or not comfortable with. Make an effort to truly consider other people. And you know what this suggests is that we have a true concern for people, that we truly love people. Because this sounds to me like the command to love one another. Truly care, be truly concerned, and truly look out for the good of others. Now let's think about this for a minute. Let's apply this. Let's, how, how does it work out? Well, one thing that I want to talk about. What is at the root of when people say rude or insulting or hurtful things to other people? I'm going to say it's pride. Selfishness. Because when people say rude things to others or hurtful things to others or selfish things to others, they put other people down. What they're doing is they're building up their own ego because I can put you down and that builds me up. Or I say something rude to you because I don't think you're as important as me or I don't think you're as good as me or that you just don't matter as much as me. And you can say these things. It's pride. It's selfishness. This is what is at the root of when people say hurtful, rude, insulting things to other people. Now let's think of a different situation. On the other hand, sometimes people are very easily insulted. And maybe... They were insulted by someone who really didn't say, he, maybe he didn't say anything bad or mean or hurtful, or maybe they misunderstood what he said. But the person who heard it felt disrespected, and now they're upset by it. And they think things like, you can't treat me like that. You can't say things like that to me. Again, what is causing the anger is pride. I've been hurt. They have treated me a way I don't feel like they should. And maybe they did. And maybe they didn't. But we get all caught up in that because of pride and self-centeredness. And then we won't ask for clarification. Did I hear you right? This is, I, I, I felt hurt because this is what I understood you as saying. We won't ask for clarification because we're upset. We won't talk through it because we're upset. 
Instead, we just carry around the hurt and we carry around a grudge. And I say again, that's pride. That's selfishness. When I care more about myself and my hurt than I do about restoring a relationship. You see, pride and selfishness always, it destroys relationships. It destroys unity. It will even destroy Christian community. But the answer to that is humility. But if we are going to truly understand humility, we must look at Jesus. And if we are going to do these things that lead to unity, then we must follow the example of Christ. Look at verse 5. Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul now is going to launch into telling us about Jesus. He's going to tell us about how, how Jesus became a man and in order to die, in order to save us from our sins, and then how he was exalted by God to the highest place. And this is a very important theological passage all by itself. On its own, it's a very important passage. But Paul puts it here for a reason. He puts it here because it teaches us about true humility. And that Jesus is the perfect example of humility. So he goes on and talks about Jesus in verse 6. He says, who, talking about Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He starts by saying who was in or existed in the form of God. This is the starting point of talking about Jesus, that he is or was God. But he says that he existed or was in the form of God. This word form here uh, could also be stated as like nature, meaning it means that you have the exact same nature, the exact same characteristics, the exact same reality. In other words, it's saying that he was God. But Jesus, who was or existed in the form of God, this tells us that Jesus has, he did not become God, when he became a man, but that he was already, he already was God and has always been. But even though he was God, he didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped or held on to. What Paul is saying about Jesus here is that Jesus did not demand recognition as God. He did not demand that people recognize him as as God. That he did not demand an advantage position. In other words, he didn't use the fact of his being God to avoid the incarnation, to avoid becoming a man. It was not beneath him, which in reality it was. It was beneath him. But you know what? He didn't have the attitude of, it's beneath me. And he was willing to do it. Jesus was not selfish, nor was he self-seeking. He continues in verse 7, he says, But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He emptied himself, or he made himself nothing. Literally, it's he emptied himself. And this word speaks of being deprived of power, being deprived of possession, being deprived of, of position. But the point Paul is making here is that he didn't demand an exalted position or he didn't make a big deal about himself. But he voluntarily, willingly humbled himself. He willingly emptied himself or made himself nothing. And Paul further explains what he means by that he emptied himself or that he made himself nothing by the next two phrases. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. And the word form here is the exact same word that was used in verse 6 when it said that he was in the form of God. So here what he's saying is that he took on the nature or the characteristics of a slave. Now he did this without ceasing to be God but he took on the nature and characteristics of a slave. So while being God, he also became a slave. Which means that he gave up his rights 
and his advantages, and he became an obedient servant to God the Father. And he says, and he emptied himself by being born in the likeness of men. Which is, he was born as a human. So here's Jesus who had always existed as God, but now he's being born. But he's being born as a human. Again, he's not ceasing to be God, but he is starting his human life, just like you and I, being born as a baby. But it says he was born in the likeness of men. Now, this is a different word. Likeness is a different word from form. And this word likeness has to do with the idea of, 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 uh, of looking like, or uh, looking, so looking like humanity, but it allows for distinctions. So what he's saying is that Jesus was similar, but not exactly the same. And Paul has carefully chosen his words here to express these things about Jesus, to, to express the miracle of the incarnation, the miracle of God becoming a man without ceasing to be God. And so his point here is that Jesus was truly human. And when people looked at him, they saw human. He was truly human like us, but he, there was one difference. And that difference was that he did not have a sin nature. He was not a sinner because he was still God. Verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So he says, now, being human... And form here is another different word, but here this word emphasizes appearance, and that so when people saw him, they saw him as human. But being human, he humbled himself even further. So we're talking about God becoming a man, and he said he still humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to even death. So as if veiling his glory and limiting his power and lowering himself to become a man wasn't enough, he even allowed himself to die and even to be put to death by other humans. But even more than that, even more than just dying, he died on a cross. Though he didn't deserve it, he died this torturous, shameful and humiliating death that was reserved only for the worst of criminals. And he did it willingly. Now that is humility. You see, he could have said, I'm God. I'm not doing that. That's beneath me. He could have said, I'm God. It's my right to be recognized by all as God. And it's my right to be seen in all my glory. But he didn't. He humbled himself. And we need to be more like Jesus. For the good of the body. For the good of the church. We need to be more like Jesus, not demanding our rights, not saying, I deserve this or I don't deserve that. But if Jesus, who was both sinless man and God, willingly humbled himself to such extremes, then shouldn't we humble ourselves as well? Then look what happens. Verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in the end, God exalted him. He exalted him to the highest place. You know what that says? That says you don't exalt yourself, you let God exalt you. Just like Jesus did. He humbled himself and God exalted him. 
Jesus was exalted to the highest place. He had the name that is above every name. That means he is above everything. So everyone, everywhere, both human and spirit beings, will bow the knee and submit to Jesus and confess that Jesus is the sovereign Lord over all. Now some will do that reluctantly, but others who know Jesus and love Jesus for them, it will be celebratory praise and worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Jesus humbled himself. God exalted him. And God is glorified by it all. And by implication, we, we know that if we, as followers of Jesus, humble ourselves, that God will exalt us. In fact, James tells us in James 4.10, humble yourself before God and He will exalt you. You see, we can be like Uncle Zeke from Muleshoe, Texas. Or we can be like Christ. We can exalt ourselves and get knocked down. Or we can humble ourselves and be exalted by God. That's the point. We know Jesus and we have experienced the benefits of knowing Jesus. And if we are followers of Jesus, then shouldn't we follow Jesus? He humbled himself, so we are to be humble also. And if we are humble, it will stop divisions, it will build unity, and it will bring glory to Jesus and to our Father.